Um, it's my honor to welcome Leslie Hawthorne. She will be giving uh, the closing keynote today, uh, which is titled The Keeper of Secrets. But I actually like the subtitle a lot more, uh, which was uh, The Dance of Community Management. So I thought it would be very appropriate because we started out with a FOSDEM dance. Maybe you know, we're going to end with the dance as well, but apparently the dancing part is, is uh, changed a bit. I, I was not told that there would be any FOSDEM dance before this talk, so I have not rehearsed. So this may be uh, the most amusing part of the presentation right now. All right, I'm ready. Let's go. Oh, I didn't know we were going to do it either. You just suggested we should. Okay. After the keynote? So who, who was here during the opening talk? Who knows, uh, who knows the dance routine? Wave your hand. OK, that's reasonable. So, uh, so basically, you, you will provide the music, uh, and we will do the dancing. And it's very advanced. Excellent. Yes. So can I hear a little clap? Not too fast. OK. And then what we do is left, clap, right, clap, left. Clap, right, clap, and then in the middle to the left, you stand on one leg and shake the other leg behind you. I can do that. Okay. That's I'm not coordinated enough to do that last move, my friend. Yeah, it's, it's advanced, I told you. Okay. So, okay, now that the stress is out, so Leslie Hawthorne, uh, she will give this closing talk, and, uh, and well, I'm just going to leave the speaking to you and the dancing as well. Awesome. Thank you. Well, so much for my opening joke that there would be no song and dance number despite what you have seen on YouTube. <clears throat> uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for coming. Uh, how's the mic working out? Good? No, mic bad. Can you hear me now? I'm just going to go like this. <laughs> All right, so we're here today to talk about secrets. And actually, secrets are a very nuanced thing. Despite the fact that it seems rather obvious, right? Either you're supposed to know something, or you're not supposed to know something. So let's go ahead and get started. The Keeper of Secrets, the Delicate Dance of community leadership. I actually wanted to call this talk this, what you see before you now. But unfortunately, it's too long, it's not very punchy, and uh, doesn't quite have the panache of the keeper of secrets. But you'll find, as you progress throughout your work in community, especially if you find yourself in the position of being a community manager or community leader, that this is pretty much your life. Everybody wants to talk to you about what's going on. They all want to share their thoughts with you, their opinions, look to you for guidance, but they really don't want you to talk about what they were talking to you about, even though they want you to be able to do things and make positive change and keep information flowing throughout the project. Needless to say, this is pretty difficult and it's also pretty funny. Uh, not in necessarily the situations, but sort of how people react to them. So we'll be going through that throughout this presentation. Standard disclaimers apply. These are my opinions. These are not the opinions of any past, present, or future employer. I've already been to the future. My employer does not hold these opinions. Uh, your mileage may vary greatly. And before we actually uh, get into the meat of our talk today, I just want to say, this was actually an incredibly difficult presentation to write. Um, the topic of this presentation is, how do you effectively hold back information while still sharing relevant details so that you maintain trust and rapport and camaraderie? And I thought, wow, I've got some juicy details of the open source community that I could talk to everybody about in a very nuanced way so no one knows who I'm talking about. and I'm maintaining confidentiality, and I'm, I better make up some stories. I'm going to be making up some stories to tell the audience of FOSDEM. So if any of you are here for uh, dirty laundry or the dirty deeds of open source done dirt cheap, that will not be a part of our presentation today. However, that will probably be happening in the usual location, the bar, right after this keynote. So you can come on down then. 
So, life as a community leader. I'll give you a moment to drink in this very detailed diagram of a day in the life of a community manager, because it's actually stunningly accurate, uh, particularly the part about what my mom thinks I do. <laughs> I like to tell folks that being a community manager or a community leader is about 25% strategy, it's about 25% marketing and outreach, kind of telling everybody what your project does. It's about 25% user or developer events, like the one we're all at today here at FOSDEM. Let's take a pause to thank and appreciate the FOSDEM staff and all the volunteers for making this possible. I would also like to take this opportunity to give a huge shout out to Bart, who drove me and two of my colleagues over to the DHL to get the awesome Red Hat gloves, otherwise we wouldn't have had them. Thank you, Bart. And the remaining 25% of your job that is not events, strategy, or outreach is unpaid therapy. <laughs> That's where you get the face palm from, what you really do. This talk will be focusing on the unpaid therapy portion of our work. All right, so before we even get started on how you deal with secrets in your community, let's talk about what secrets actually are because this is actually pretty nuanced. And we're all clearly worried about secrets and how we share and don't share information in our open source projects. Or this wouldn't be a staple of our common dialogue, right? There is no cabal. If there was no cabal, you wouldn't have to talk about there not being one. If we weren't worried that people were sharing information secretly and doing nefarious things with it, we wouldn't have this phrase. So if there's no cabal, we all know there's a bunch of people having one-to-one -one or small group conversations. This is what human beings do. And isn't it amazing that there's this wonderful man who we know very well and think is a great guy and we love having beers with him, totally trust him. And there's this great gal, love hanging out with her, she makes great technical decisions, we would never ever think askance of anything that she does. Put those two people alone in a room together and we immediately want to know what they're up to. <laughs> because clearly all that stuff that we already knew about how awesome they were has completely changed now that they are talking to only each other. And add into the mix one other human being that we totally trust, admire, have high regard for, they are totally up to no good. What are they trying to do to mess with us? It's probably pretty bad. Yeah, probably not. But again, human nature and our reactions to other people. So all those people getting together, having that chit chat, isn't that a cabal? I mean, you know they've gotta be talking about the project and what's going on with the project because they care about the project and are they making decisions without us? Are they going to share that information with us? Doesn't that totally suck? Well, actually they're probably just talking about beer and potato chips, let's be honest. And one-to-one -one and one-to-few conversations are not always harmful. This is just part of our social glue and our social contract that keeps our wider group discussions that either happen in person at events like this or on mailing lists or through other electronic means going because that in-person social glue is required for the effective functioning of our communities. Secrets are even worse than just our tensions around them or our fears around them. Sometimes you don't even know when something is a secret. Someone's talking to you and they're telling you things honestly, candidly, and it's clear that they're hoping for positive change, especially when you're a community leader, right? People don't just come to you and vent at random. They probably want you to do something about what it is that they're saying. So, okay, great, they've given you this wonderful information drop. Now what do you do with it? Are you supposed to be talking to somebody about it? When is something a secret? I've got a great friend of mine in the Drupal community who's a community manager, and we were talking about this presentation and she said, yeah, I'm really bad at knowing when something's a secret, but I'm really great at keeping up morale. And I went, what exactly does that mean? And she said, well, it's never really clear to me what people don't want to have talked about, but I'm really, really good at sharing the details that people really need to know to be successful. And I said, well, yeah, that sounds about right. So, so how often does that get you in trouble? And she's like, oh, it's never gotten me in trouble. I run really fast. <laughs> Fair enough. 
So we're social creatures, right? That's what human beings are. Um, I may occasionally joke that the open source community is a group of very loving, uh, clucking chickens, gossiping amongst ourselves. If this sounds like you, it's okay, it's all of us. This Again, this is group therapy, group unpaid therapy. So we talk about the things that matter to us, and we talk about them a lot. So at any given time, when we're talking to our friends, we're talking about our project work, the code we write, documentation we're doing, our social lives, uh, fortunately, I think we've all grown up to the point now where we probably have them, as opposed to my teenage years, which I spent, uh, well, basically with my nose stuck in a book, not, a, not talking to the other humans or the other chickens. So we talk about the things that matter to us, and we all live in this really kind of schizophrenic, weird universe where we all know that there are things we are not supposed to talk about, but we totally do it anyway because we have to or because that's human nature. So a perfect example of this is uh, there is an open source project I'm on the board of, and I'm also a mentor to uh, a young woman who's their community manager. She's not a member of the board, uh, but she and I have an excellent rapport and we frequently talk about topics that are personal and professional and related to her education, so kind of the gamut in that relationship. And the number of times that she has come to me and said, hey, I need information to do my job, blah, 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 and starts talking to me about something that happened in a closed board session where ostensibly none of us are ever supposed to talk to anybody about what we discuss, discussed around that table. Happens all the time. Uh, the number of times I've had to go and have that dialogue with her is substantial. And yet, none of the members of the board have ever sat down and looked at each other and said, so the stuff that's happening in this closed session that we've all agreed that we're not going to talk to anybody else about, we totally have to go talk to these other people about it, right? <laughs> okay, great, let's go talk to them about it. That dialogue has never actually happened. How often does this happen to you guys? How, how often are you like, okay, this is a secret and you, you can't tell anybody. No, this is one of those secrets you really can't tell anybody, right? It, this can't only be me, you guys. <laughs> All right. So there are things that we understand are, are delicate or sensitive information, and we still talk about them because we require validation and input from our peers, right? We can't just make all of our decisions in a vacuum and on our own. How about the secrets that are really great? Most of the time we think of secrets as being negative. There are some secrets that are pretty awesome. Yes, this is the shameless plug slide, and all will become clear in just a second. So this is uh, what I like to call an open secret. It's only a secret if you're the wrong person getting the information. Uh, how many of you folks have heard of the Oregon State University Open Source Lab? Awesome. So these fine folks, including Mr. Lance Albertson, seated right here, uh, are responsible for doing the hosting work and systems administration for a large number of uh, the world's greatest free software projects, including Debian. Uh, and they do this on the salary of academics working in IT at an American university. Please buy Lance lots of beer. <laughs> and all of the folks who were out there in the community getting support from the OSL uh, frequently, including during my uh, brief tenure there, saying, what can we do to help you guys? And you know, obviously, government employees cannot accept uh, donations or gifts. So, but the students, they're interns working in the lab. Well, you know, why don't we buy them a beer? Now, needless to say, American universities have all kinds of very interesting laws about whether or not you're allowed to serve alcohol on campus, whether or not someone buying you a beer represents a gift, and a bunch of other just truly horrifying administrivia that no one really wants to interact with on, under any circumstances. So the students got clever and created the OSL Beer Fund. Now, this is clearly not a secret because, as you can see, it has a URL, so it's totally on the internet, right? Like, it's there. But it's not as though anyone has walked up to the dean of the college and pointed out, like, there's an OSL beer fund. You should totally give them some money, right? You appreciate your student interns. So sometimes information is only a secret if you tell the wrong person. But it's completely out there in plain sight and visible to everybody. It's just, not a, ma just a matter of not unearthing it or up-leveling it. See what I mean? Secrets are complicated. So the best part about this is that I, I'm, 
I'm about to get myself in trouble with Lance, so I'll be good. The best part about this is that I understand that our administration knows that the OSL is a group of amazing individuals who do these amazing magical things that they will never understand. So they never research it, it's amazing. <laughs> <coughs> this slide will also be deleted when this presentation goes up on slideshare.net, just in case. This never happened. <laughs> I want you all in on this secret with me. I knew that, they're not gonna watch the video, they're gonna watch the first five seconds, they're gonna be like, oh, it's that girl, she doesn't work here anymore. It's gonna be awesome. <laughs> Some secrets, such as our beer fund secret, are, are pretty innocuous, right? Like, how often do you get together and you start talking about, oh, so-and-so has, has a crush on so-and-so, and so-and-so -and -so is dating so-and-so, and so-and-so -and -so thinks so-and-so is pretty. You know, those conversations that you have, that you stop having as soon as your own love life is really exciting, right? So. Uh, you know, maybe that's not something that, you know, you want to talk about really widely. Maybe it's kind of a secret. Maybe it's kind of not. It's not like they posted it on Facebook. Maybe they have privacy concerns. Maybe they don't want anybody to know. Who knows? But sharing that kind of information really isn't that big of a deal, right? We talk about these kinds of topics because we care about our friends and we want them to be happy. So, eh, maybe those kinds of secrets, not a big deal to talk about. So. We accept that human nature is to talk about the things that are important to us. We accept the fact that we all understand that we're going to talk about things that we're not supposed to talk about. Okay, now how do we tell what we're really not supposed to talk about? Because there's all that stuff we're not supposed to talk about that we talk about anyway. That's tough too. And this is the best part. The things that people won't tell you that are blindingly obvious. Like when you're sitting in a room with someone and someone walks in and they, the, the person that you are talking to immediately develops a nervous tick and it is taking all of their energy not to flee the room because the individual who has just entered is someone that they'd prefer not to spend any time with. And yet we all pretend that this has not occurred and ignore it because that is the polite and civilized thing to do because no one has voiced their opinion. So clearly nothing here is actually going on. Oh, come on, this has to happen to you too. Okay, no one's laughing because they're like, oh yeah, I remember when that happened, that was really uncomfortable. <laughs> so, as I mentioned previously, this all becomes infinitely more complex, interesting, and difficult when you're a community leader. Because all of this type of communication is happening amongst human groups everywhere in any area, including free software. But when you're a community leader and people are coming to you and talking to you about stuff, they're not just coming to you to shoot the breeze, nine times out of 10. They want you to do something about it. You can save us, right? You were there, you were Sparta, you were standing there shielded instead of face palming. You can fix this. Well, actually you probably can and here are some useful tips on how to do so. Capable leaders create empathy and inclusion. What does that mean? So. The process of creating empathy is to be able to show other perspectives to individuals in your community in a way that they will understand. And creating that empathy creates inclusion because we no longer feel like we're isolated and siloed in terms of our own experience. We're engaging in a shared experience with others. Let's go through. Oh, hey, we should probably talk about that. That seems useful. So <laughs> creating empathy and inclusion is not just about what you say. It's about how you say it, right? Understanding your audience and understanding how to give them information and data that they're actually going to be able to understand and make use of. Uh, there's not really a lot of point in talking to somebody about something if they're not going to listen to a word you say because they're feeling defensive, stressed out, or like you have no clue what's actually going on for them. So let's talk about how you do this effectively. So uh, I have two case studies in this presentation. These are uh, common occurrences in communities that involve secrets and useful ways to route through them if you want to be an effective community leader. So my favorite, when you have to share something but you really shouldn't. So how often does this happen? You have a contributor who is in the critical path and they're having a terrible time of it, right? And I promised this presentation was supposed to be funny, so we're not going to go through the usual things that happen in this situation, car accidents, new jobs, uh, deciding that you'd rather reprogram everything in .NET, et cetera. Like, we're not even touching that. So instead, let's, uh, let's, take, a, uh, 
Let's take as an example, we're, we're gonna call him Groe or our friend Gren. So Gren heard a rumor that if you kiss a Melanesian frog, uh, you will not only be given a million dollars, but the Melanesian frog will turn into a princess. So Gren went ahead and did this and discovered that uh, he'd been lied to. And actually the only thing that happens is you begin to ribbit and lose your voice and your fingers turn into flippers, so it's pretty hard to type. And needless to say, Gren doesn't really want to talk to anybody about the fact that this is going on. Because who wants to admit they kissed a frog? Nobody. I, I may have done a couple in my day, there you go. We're getting to the radical honesty section later. So, then, unfortunately, the rest of the community, when it seems perfectly logical that maybe Gren is just having a bad time of it, decides that this is in fact somehow a deliberate oversight of their needs, right? How many times has it occurred that someone who is completely capable, really knows what's going on, knows what they're doing, they disappear for a while, and then this kind of thing starts? Oh man, I always knew Gren was a flake. You remember five years ago when he broke the build? Oh my God, that was terrible. Oh man, and yeah, remember that other time when like he was supposed to pick us up at the bar the other night and he totally got lost and he was like two hours late? Man, he does this all the time. You've been there, you know it. All right, and the best part is everyone will talk to each other about this. Everyone will talk to you about this. Nobody's gonna talk to Gren. Why would you do that? Why would you directly address the matter? Because that is confrontation. And confrontation is really, really uncomfortable. So we think it's way easier to waste cycles talking to each other about how we're all stressed out than actually attempting to solve the problem. Because we are human beings and we are very clever. Hey, you know what, if you advance the slide, I will love you forever and recommend you to all my friends. One moment, please, we are experiencing technical difficulties. Apparently the frog gods get angry when you mock them at Fosdom. So, all of these situations lead to facepalm, or what I like to call why your community leaders deserve combat pay. Because you are inevitably, as the trusted, gentle, well-regarded advisor uh, who, can who can affect positive change, right? Who can really move things forward. You're the one who's called in to deal with this problem because, you know, you're good at this kind of thing. So you're like, okay, here we go again. So how do you actually deal with it? All right, so in a situation like this where someone's holding back, and they really need to talk about it. The easiest thing to do is encourage disclosure, right? Like, hey, Gren, it would be really great if you could tell everybody that you're sick and that you won't be around for a while because there's all these bugs that are waiting on you and no one wants to step on your toes, right? It's okay that you kissed a frog. I kissed a few toads in my day. It happens to the best of us. No one's judging you. Secretly, everybody will be judging Gren, though, so he's not going to buy it. Uh, you can then, if the person that you're dealing with isn't really comfortable uh, saying what's going on with them, ask them for permission to do it yourself and in a way that's comfortable, right? So maybe you don't want to share the kissing a frog detail, but it's totally cool to say that Gren's sick and he'll probably be back around in about two months. So let's figure out who can take on the work while he's gone. And last but not least, you can just encourage all the people around you who don't want to talk to this person that they could probably do it themselves. No, really, it's probably not helping us to all talk to each other about how we feel. Maybe we could talk to the individual involved. This is magic. <laughs> this also rarely happens, but I'm hoping that this talk will produce positive change in our communities. All right, case study number two, the person who just doesn't get it. Every community has this person. In this case, we will be referring to our dear contributor, Mr. Obi-Wan Blender. So Mr. Blender is one of those people who is really sweet and really cool and really dedicated, who really just doesn't understand what's going on. This is the person who is probably one of your greatest cheerleaders, is really great at bringing in new users, a huge advocate for your project, but when they try and get work done, they just can't do it. You've met this person. I have been this person on projects, actually. I was really glad that I noticed and walked away before someone had to tell me to go. Um, and the problem is, people who are really good-hearted, who, who kind of like, you know, uh, it's kind of hard to figure out how to deal with them because they just don't get it, they actually kind of harm the flow of the project, right? Because here we go again. People get cranky. 
and they weigh cycles, and they get tired when they kind of have to reroute you and sort of push you over here or try and put you over there or in some way mitigate the fact that you are making crazy decisions for whatever reason. Maybe it is because you're actually crazy. Mr. Blender is wearing a Jedi robe and carrying a blender. I think crazy is, is reasonable conclusion to come to. So people don't want to spend a lot of time hurting people and trying to make them figure out what, what's going on. They get cranky, they stop doing their work because they're worried about how you're not get, letting them take the time to do their work with your particular missteps. So we have, as a community, excellent processes for sharing code. We know what a good bug report looks like. We know how to talk to each other about software. This is actually a quote from my good friend Josh Burkus. But what we don't have is something to teach us how we talk about our emotions, our frustrations, and our concerns. There's nothing like that. There is no way to say, hey, this is how you have a difficult conversation, at least not in open source. There are resources for having difficult conversations. And fortunately, those appear in the resources section. And we can talk about those later. Again, you're going to be in the same situation, especially when you're dealing with someone who's really nice, your good-hearted contributor who is just clueless. Nobody wants to tell the good-hearted contributor that they're just clueless. That feels painful. Who wants to do that? Everybody's irritated. They'll totally talk to each other. They'll talk to you. Not going to talk to the individual involved. Usually what people do in this situation is they ignore somebody. Slash ignore. I don't notice you. I don't notice your posts to the mailing lists. I don't know what you're working on. When you come into the room, all conversation will cease. And it's not like the person involved on the other side of this equation doesn't notice that when they walk in the room, all conversations cease. So they're just busy trying to ignore the fact that you're ignoring them because it's uncomfortable for them too. So not only does it take a lot of cycles to ignore somebody, believe it or not, uh, it takes even more cycles to get people to stop ignoring what's going on because they've disengaged because someone is irritating them. And if you don't believe it's really hard to get people to stop ignoring something, how many of you are ignoring me because you're trying to figure out what that number on this sign means? <laughs> Excellent. This is a secret code so you can get a free t-shirt after this talk. That is a lie. I'm very sorry about that. However, there will be, there will be alcohol. <laughs> so dealing with situations like this is really difficult and messy. And this goes back to the slash ignore rule. If you're a community leader, one of the best techniques you can use as a is a, in a situation like this is something that I call the last lecture technique. Uh, there was a gentleman named Randy Posh who was a computer science professor at Carnegie Mellon University. And when he discovered that he had pancreatic cancer, he gave what was called the last lecture. And one of the stories that he told in this was about his football coach and how he hated his football coach. Because when he was a young man, his football coach never had anything nice to say to him. He always fumbled the pass. He wasn't running fast enough. His uniform was untidy. Why, you know, constantly just rode him and made him miserable. And then when he got older, he realized that he was incredibly grateful because the reason that his coach criticized him so much is because he believed in him and believed in his capacity to be better, to be a better player to be more effective. When you have to have one of these difficult conversations with somebody, remind them that if you didn't care, if you didn't believe in them, if you didn't know how awesome they really were, you'd have them on slash ignore. You wouldn't be taking the time to speak to them. You wouldn't be taking the time to address it with them because it's easier to say nothing than to say something difficult. And usually that's a really great way to open those channels of communication in a way that's really positive and filled with mutual respect. So, our how-to, creating empathy and inclusion. So in the case of folks who are clueless, Mr., uh, for example, Mr. Obi-Wan Blender didn't realize that carrying around his blender really disturbed people because he thought we were all geeks and we really like our electronic gadgets, so why wouldn't he bring his blender to every event? <clears throat> Perhaps now's a good time to let him know that tablets are a bit more fitting. Um, if you're dealing with somebody who is really, really awesome, but just not in what they're trying to do, suggest other ways they can be effective, right? Like I said, usually folks who are a little clueless are sometimes your best community cheerleaders. That's great. Pair them up with somebody who wants them to do, uh, you know, marketing outreach work. It's, you know, something that they're really good at and that they can be making a positive impact on the project on and hopefully keeping them away from your developers who may be slightly miffed. Last but not least, it's okay to ask people to go away. Do it nicely, do it kindly, 
thank them for their effort and for their service to your project, but if they're actually making things worse, it's okay to ask them to go. Someone may point out that that doesn't seem a lot like inclusion. <clears throat> You're including them in the wider world of things that they can do. That's very kind of you. All right. Um, other techniques for increasing community happiness, love, and affection. Uh, have any folks uh, heard of David Eaves and the work he's done on negotiation and effective leaders doing negotiation well in open source projects? Okay, I've got two thumbs. That means for the rest of you, this brief is going to be useful, exciting, and hopefully awesome. All right, so why negotiation theory is important. Your project will go bankrupt from all those combat pay payouts to your community leaders. We also call this project leader burnout. These are techniques that everyone in the audience can use to have these kind of candid dialogues with their fellow project members. So your nice community manager doesn't always have to be the one being the bad guy and talking to the guy who's now a frog. It gets very tiring. There, this may be why some of us occasionally drink heavily. Like right after this talk. So uh, one quick principle on negotiation. Uh, Every negotiation involves a discussion around uh, our int the intersection of our interests and our relationship. And sometimes we have a really great relationship, but we really don't want the same things, etc. And having conversations with our friends is super easy, right? Because we get along really well with them and we want the same things, right? And we never think of those conversations as being a negotiation, even though they are because it feels pleasant. I wanna go get dinner. You want Thai food? Yeah, I want Thai food. Let's go get Thai food. Easy, that was a negotiation. When we have conversations where we're not in this wonderful little green quadrant, we automatically think of those things as negotiations, right? Because what we've decided is that it's automatically gonna suck. We have already pre-gamed this conversation in our head and decided that it's gonna suck. So if we have a great relationship but our interests are poorly aligned, we're already thinking about how Bob is gonna totally wanna help us out, but he can't because the boss says no, and he's totally gonna like maybe try and like take us to the ball game this weekend so that we stay friends, but we're not gonna get what we want. Maybe we could point out to him that our, we did his boss a favor like three years ago, and maybe that'll help us get through this more quickly. Or, and in the worst of scenarios, right, where your relationship is terrible and your interests are totally unaligned, you're just walking in there going, all right, so this is gonna be an hour of my life I'm never gonna get back sitting across the table from some so-and-so. <laughs> Giving yourself an ulcer. It's not a lot of fun. So here's the crazy thing. We walk into all of these conversations and we've already decided what the outcome is going to be and how we're gonna try and route around that outcome. We don't actually have any freaking clue what's gonna happen in that conversation. You don't know what the other person wants. You don't necessarily know what the other person needs. Has anyone actually gotten the free software psychic generation mind beam project working yet? Well, why didn't you tell me that before I got up here and embarrassed myself like this? That's an open secret, sir. <laughs> Alcohol. Alcohol is not an open secret. We've been doing that for years. So the most important thing in having useful dialogue with our fellow community members is you have to be willing to ask for what you need. So <clears throat> negotiation theory in brief. Come to the table and make sure that you understand the expectations of the person that you're talking to. Ask them what they need. Be open to listening to, ask, to, to the answer, right? Don't ha already have made the decision about what you know they need. What they say may completely surprise you. And once you have laid out what you need and have a better understanding of what they need to be successful, that's when you begin to look for common ground or what folks in negotiation theory call reaching agreement. It's a highly technical phrase. It means we've decided that the same thing is okay. This is highly technical. Harvard has a whole project on this, folks. You're getting a free Harvard degree in 15 minutes. If you cannot reach agreement, you want to find the most optimal solution for both parties. This is also called BATNA or best alternative to no agreement. If you find that after having this dialogue and actually being open to get, making sure that everybody gets what they want, that it's not working out, that's, it's okay. It's okay not to reach agreement. 
You can always talk more later. So the deal is that this requires practicing radical honesty. You actually have to talk about what you really want and what you're really afraid you're not going to get. And I would like to stand here before you today as an advocate of radical honesty because I think it would be a lot better if we all talked about what was really going on with us instead of talking to each other about how we're miffed at each other or how we're miffed at that other person over there. This is so much more efficient, folks. Efficiency is everything. Now, that being said, radical honesty is not the art of being a tactless jerk. Walking up to someone and saying, you didn't get me the following three things that I asked you for and I'm feeling really irritated by you, is probably not going to get the same result as walking up to someone and saying, uh, I was hoping to get this, this, and this. Um, can I help you out with that? Or, you know, what's your ETA? And when the ETA is, oh, I'll get to that next week, and you've heard that 17 weeks ago every week, you know, hey, can I help you, uh, can I help you out? I actually need it faster than next week. What can I do to help make that happen? Be there, be honest, be available. Uh, and that is behaving diplomatically, and that is not the fine art of being disingenuous. Um, how many of you folks in the audience feel like if they say something to someone politely, that they are lying and they now need to go home and take a shower? I think that may be several people. I myself may have suffered from the I now need to go and take a shower disease for a while. Um, it's not about being disingenuous. It's not about putting a spin on it. It's not about marketing speak. Though I do work in marketing, so your mileage may vary. This is about, do you want to be right or do you want to win? Do you want to be right when you talk to somebody about whatever topic it is that you're discussing? Or do you want you both to reach your common goals? If you want to be right, you can get up in someone's face and say exactly what you think, exactly how you think it, with no editing and being pissed off, frankly. If you want to win, that's not the conversation you have. The conversation that you have is much more about mutual respect, mutual goals, and finding agreement. Talking to your audience in a way that they will understand the information that you provide them so that they too can act in a positive fashion and achieve positive change. So since I'm standing here telling all of you that we should all practice radical honesty, um, I'm going to practice some radical honesty because it's really easy to stand up here and say, practice radical honesty, everybody. Thank you, I'll be here all week. Um, it's another thing entirely to do it. Um, it's really easy to say that it's easy to talk to people about what we really want and what we really need and what we're really afraid we aren't gonna get. Uh, it's another thing to actually do it and to be vulnerable and to, to put ourselves out there. So um, here are some of my secrets. Um, I removed the really uh, interesting secrets from this slide on the advice of my dear friends in the audience, uh, all of whom have been doing this. If you think you've been seeing people doing the wave, that's not true. I have plants throughout the auditorium reminding me when to slow down. Thank you all for all of that. <laughs> Um, it's not easy. Practicing radical honesty is not easy, but I think it's vital to the success of our communities and frankly the success of us as human beings in leveling up. So, in conclusion, the only secret you folks actually really need, being an effective community leader means actually, this is being videotaped, I wonder if my boss will watch this, giving a shit. You actually have to give a shit. You actually have to care. If you don't actually care, you're not going to get anywhere. And that means caring about the success of your project, your fellow project members, and human, your fellow human beings in general, right? If you don't care, you're not gonna get the results that you want. You get, your output is what your input is. Especially when people are annoying the crap out of you, that's the time that you have to love them the most. Thank you, and any questions, folks? There will be a song and dance number, fortunately for all of you, not done by me. So that's very, very awesome. Questions, comments, Rotten Tomatoes? I'm going to take that as European audiences are often more reticent to ask, oh, there's an actual question. I'm very excited. Hi, Bart, how's it going? Hi. Um, what do you do when you try to nudge someone in the right direction and they just get angry with you? while you're trying to be nice? 
Um, well, that sort of depends on the human, right? So the nice part about like really actually caring is that um, hopefully you've spent a lot of time observing what this human wants and doesn't want and how they react in situations where they're angry. So usually if someone is, is reacting in a really angry fashion, the first thing that I do is, is to do a self-awareness check, right? What I was talking about before with your audience, like is something in the way that I've expressed this thought causing them to feel defensive or upset? Because usually it's, it's my mistake. It's my mistake if someone doesn't, it's, it's my mistake if someone does, has a poor reaction to something that I say. Um, and if they remain angry, then you say, I'm very sorry that I've caused you offense. That was not my intention. I would really love to keep discussing this with you, but it sounds like now is a really bad time. I'll, t I'll chat with you about this later. And then actually do it, right? Don't just throw the conversation on the floor because it was unpleasant for you. Come back to them and say, I really want to understand where you're coming from. Yeah, well, the problem is he basically thinks everything he knows is right. And when something doesn't fit into that, he's, he just gets angry. So yes, so there is okay. Yes, so the ha ha ha. I am always right and ha ha ha. You are always wrong human We love that human um, <laughs> So I found it's it's best in situations like that to potentially get people a couple of beers and then start talking to them about moral philosophy and how uh, No one is infallible and seeing if they bite um, if that doesn't work uh, That might just be someone you don't want to spend a lot of time with not everyone is salvageable my dear friend <laughs> And the other thing you can do is go and find your nice community leader who can go over and say, I don't understand why you're doing this. This doesn't really help. You are not helping. And when they look at you askance and funny, then they're yelling at somebody else, so you're totally safe, right? Your community leaders take one for the team. They'll take the yelling. You're welcome. I hope that was somewhat helpful. Hello. Nice gentleman in the red scarf with the open BSD thingy. Hello, Blowfish. Um, any advices on when the secrets actually concern the community leader themselves? Like, what, what if you actually burned out as a community leader? Any opinion on that? I think that sort of depends. If the secret is that our community leader is actually an alien angry robot from the planet Murgatroyd coming to murder all of us, I would suggest, like, get that out there now. Um, if this is, you know, can I, may I have an example or will that reveal a greater level of detail than we prefer? What do you do? Oh, what do you do when you, oh, thank you. Okay, so the question is, if you're a community leader, what do you do when you burn out? That is an excellent question. Um, one, walk away. If you are, and by the way, you all know when you're burning out, it's because you wake up every day and think, oh my God, I don't want to do this anymore. Why am I still doing this? Why am I still doing this? When three years ago, you were waking up every day saying, oh, I have the coolest stuff in the whole world to do. Like, that evolution is pretty clear. Um, so, first step, take a vacation, like a real vacation. Put the laptop down. Put the electronic devices down. Step away from the keyboard. Hug a tree. You don't actually have to hug a tree, that's just what I do. Um, but I have found it to be very effective. <laughs> uh, if you come back from some time away from the commitments that you have that have been exhausting you and you find they still exhaust you, uh, your best bet is to work with as many people as you can to get somebody else taking on your tasks and hopefully you've already created a secession plan of some sort. But if you haven't, then that's the time to do it. And the reason why you do it as quickly as you can is not because you want to throw up your hands and say, I'm over all this. It's because nothing takes down a community faster than their leader being burnt out, sad and unhappy and miserable. And you don't want to watch people doing, have people watching you do it. Um, and frankly, when we're burnt out, it's not usually that we're burnt out because we think our community sucks or our project sucks. It's because we've been doing the same thing for a really, really long time and maybe there isn't as much new in it for us. So when we see a problem, it's the same problem we've always seen. And when we see something that's great, it doesn't feel that great anymore because we've already seen that great thing happen so many times. And it's just time to move on and find green and go on and do something else that's more exciting. And if all that fails, drink heavily. The end. Where can we get your slides? 
Where can we what? Get your slides. We will be sending these out via the internet after we add another resource to the resources section. It will be online by, I'm going to make a commitment that I'm actually going to keep by Tuesday. I was about to say by Monday. If I ever tell you I'm going to get you something tomorrow, I'm totally getting it to you the day after tomorrow. There's another secret for all of you. Uh, <laughs> online on Hawthorne Landings, the or where? One more time, dear. What? What did you say? I'm sorry. Where? I will put them up on SlideShare. I will give a copy to the conference organizers. I am willing to email a copy upon request. I will send this information out by Twitter and Identica. Awesome. Thank you, sir. There's a hand way up there. Thar? I don't know. I've been. To, I I live with her. What do you think's gonna happen? <laughs> Embedded Linux development, all sorts of crazy stuff happening in this house. Hey. Yes, ma'am. Um, my question would be: How do you jumpstart a community when you deal with a group of people that are so used to ignoring each other? There is no community there. So I think I heard you correctly. Let me make sure I did. The question is: How do you jumpstart a community when things have gone really, really wrong, and now you want them to be better again? Or you're new to the group and there is no group. <laughs> I did not actually understand what you said. Oh, sorry. I can make up an answer. <laughs> so you're new to a group and there is no group. So. Oh, uh, excellent. So you're new to a group, there is no group, and you want to coalesce around a center of gravity of awesomeness for the project. Yeah, for example, yeah. Excellent. <laughs> I can totally answer that question. And not make up an answer, which is even better. Um, so my recommendation in those cases is to do your best to get folks together in person. Um, I know that we collaborate online and we kind of think ourselves as exclusively online collaborating creatures, but you form your social bonds in person, right? It makes so much more difference when you can see somebody across the table when you have that discussion, or even just with electronic communication. I don't know how many of you folks do this, but when I get an email from someone and I've met them, I can kind of hear their voice in my head as I'm reading. You know, here's where the vocal inflections would be. Here's where this is totally a joke, even though it doesn't read like this because I've never met you before, but now I've met you. And it's clear that when you're t telling me that I'm a complete idiot, that it's a joke. We could all just be nicer to each other, but that's another, that's a completely different talk. <coughs> um, so get people together in person. If you can't people get to, to get together in person, then it's cool to have things like um, IRC office hours or IRC meetings where everybody gets together at least at the same time as much as possible. Uh, online to chat um, and when you do that it's really important to be respectful of time zones right if you have a global community and that's one of the reasons it's hard to get everybody together in person you don't want the person in say oh I don't know who, who does this always happen to in China we have a team member in China and he's always the person who's up at like one o'clock in the morning for our con calls right don't don't do that to that contributor all the time right rotate rotate the times I'm feeling guilty. We just, I just met DV last week, and now I feel a great deal of empathy about his up at 1 o'clock in the morning for our staff call, so we should change that. <clears throat> Random bits from LH's to-do list. There you go. Hmm. Was that a sufficiently useful answer? Because I can, I can stand up here and BS for another 10 minutes if you'd like. <laughs> All right, I win! Oh, wait, 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 please. There is another, another question. Yes. So, hi, everybody. Where is the nice human? I'm right here. Um, here? Yeah, here. Here. Oh, hey, hey, how's it going? Thanks. <laughs> Hello. So, um, before asking the question, I'll just remind that when we say or, it's implicitly an exclusive or. And I want to ask you something about one of your slides that oppose right to winning. And I have uh, a question about this because usually we, we talk about how we achieve things, but not really the goals, I agree. And this slide was all about goals. And another slide right after mentioned that um, we need to care about the people and we need to, to, as you said, give a shit about the project. Both of them. So is that a mistake or...? Uh, I don't understand your question at all. My, my I apologize. Question, my question is, does right really oppose to winning or can we achieve uh, both? I see. Um, I think th that what I should do is clarify uh, what I meant by do you want to be right or do you want to win? Um, because uh, that's probably idiomatic um, for my social group. Um, the concept of do you want to be right is uh, no matter what happens, 
I am correct. Even if it has been shown that I have made a poor judgment call in the decision that I have made or in the opinion that I have taken, I am right. Full stop. I will always be right. I am right. And you will come to understand things my way because I say so. Um, that and, and do you want to win is would you rather be successful? Would you rather see something succeed? Is this, is this a question of I feel slighted or I feel harmed and I'm going to go to an individual and I'm going to make sure that they really understand that they were wrong and that I am right and that their opinion was bad versus we have something we want to get done and it's probably more important that we focus on getting that done versus focusing on who said what or who irritated who or who made someone feel uh, poor in the dialogue. Does that make more sense now? Sort of. Okay, so what doesn't make, you know what, we're going to talk about this over a delicious cocktail, is that fair? Because I feel like this is long and nuanced and I am also not entirely certain how to answer you effectively. So. In practicing radical honesty, I think I probably have to think about what you're asking me instead of just coming up with a pat answer up here. And there is just time for one last question. So There's what? You have uh, to cut. Uh, there is time for just one last question, so we have to. One last question. I was actually just going to comment or add to what you said about uh, being right versus winning. And uh, I, th I think uh, added to that is the mission versus the strategy or the tactics. So if you have a goal or a mission for your project, that that is more important than having it done your way. Unless you can properly articulate why your way is better with data and graphs and things. And so if, I hope that might add to why it's more important to win than to be right. Like, think of what you want out of the situation rather than how you like to do things. Uh, thank you, Deb. That was is beautifully that articulated, and I appreciate that I have to spend slightly less time thinking of a good answer after this talk. You rock. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you.